Welcome to this guest episode of Starting a Business Simplified. Today I have special guest, Deanna Cooper Gillingham. She's a registered nurse, certified case manager, and fellow of case management. Deanna began her nursing career in 1994 and worked in various settings, finally ending up in case management in 2011. She landed her dream job as a work-from-home case manager, but still did not have the freedom and flexibility she desired. So she started a side hustle helping other case managers get their certification. In just a few short years, she was able to leave her job and take the leap into full-time entrepreneurship, and she hasn't looked back since. This conversation is packed full of valuable insights as you start your own business, transitioning from a nursing career to an entrepreneur is a step-by-step process. Deanna shares her insights of how she did this and what worked best for her. So I hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome to Starting a Business Simplified, Navigating the Shift a podcast for those of you looking to transition from a medical career to starting an online business. I will be sharing how to get started, success stories, and more. If you are looking to make the move from medicine to online, but don't know where to start, this is the podcast for you. I'm Susie Raines, your host, and I look forward to helping you simplify starting a business. Hi, Deanna. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Susie. Thank you for inviting me. I'm really excited about this. Me too. Oh, my goodness. After we chatted, I was like, this is going to be such a good episode. (laughs) For those of you listening, I introduced Deanna before this. Before we dive into our topic and really start talking about things, would you mind just sharing a little bit about yourself, your story of how you got to where you are and what you're doing right now? Sure. So I'm a nurse. I've been a nurse since the 1990s. So I think it was 94 when I graduated, 96, something like that. I don't want to remember, but it was a long time ago. Worked in various areas of nursing. Always loved what I did, but it just got to the point where things changed. I got older and eventually I moved into case management, which was more of a desk desk job for those who aren't familiar with that, and worked from an office. Finally got the opportunity to work from home, which was my dream and my goal. And I did that and I still wasn't satisfied. There was just something that was like, I need to do something else. And I started listening to podcasts about businesses. And one of the podcasts I was listening to, actually, to just kind of back up a little bit, I asked to keep my job, which I liked. It was a work from home job. So I wanted to keep it. I had to pass a certification exam Mm -hmm. and I was started studying for it. And I, I knew the book that I was looking for that basically had the exam blueprint. We knew what we were going to be tested on. And I went something that addressed all the different areas and everything I found had pieces missing, like very large pieces missing. And I couldn't find this information and I was looking for it. And I was listening to a podcast on business and somebody said, if you can't find a solution to a problem, maybe you need to create it. And I was like, oh, does that mean I'm supposed to write this book? So long story short, I did write the book and that was the The basis of our business, it started off with just a book and we've grown it now into a multi six figure business that allowed me to leave the bedside, leave case management also, work full time in my business and we're currently traveling the world. That's so amazing. I love your story and I love if you can't find a solution, just create it. But that's huge advice. And that's what I did in my business as well. Some of you listening, maybe you're thinking the same thing. You're thinking, man, I wish this was available. And it's not. So go ahead and create it. It's totally okay. That's the beautiful thing of being a business owner is that you get to create whatever you want. Would you mind describing a little bit about what it is that your business does now? Because you started with the book. So the book was about filling in all those gaps with case management that you were, those things that was missing that you were looking for. How did that expand? Do you mind sharing that? Yeah, that's a really good question. Because, you know, even when I started, I knew I wanted a business and I kept telling myself like a book is not a business. It's a book. So how am I going to go from author to entrepreneur? There's that quote from Martin Luther King Jr. You don't need to see the whole staircase. You just need to see the next step. So I was trying to think too big. And I look back now and I realize I just needed to do the one thing. And honestly, our audience kind of told us what to do next. So, you know, we had the book. It did really well. We got great feedback. 
We com- created a community around people that were studying for that exam. We ended up doing, they were asking for a course. So we're like, okay. And that was our next step was creating a course. And then we did different iterations on that between an online live and an on-demand course. So we had several different courses because people would say, well, I need this. I need accountability. I need to be told I need to show up. Okay, now we're going to do a live course. We had iterations on that. Then I found out people were using my certification prep book to train new case managers. And my problem with that is like when I wrote the certification prep, you have to have experience. Like certification means that you are experienced and have expertise in something. And so I kind of had a little mini freak out and I was like, no, no, no. This assumes that you already have a basic knowledge. And it's very different from bedside nursing. Like when you go from one area to another in the hospital, you take a lot of your skills with you, especially your you know, starting an IV, inserting a Foley, assessing heart sounds, lung sounds, all those types of things you can transfer. But now you don't have necessarily a patient in front of you and you have to do more book work, like you're, you're reading notes, you're evaluating on a totally different level. You have to know understand insurance, Medicare, Medicaid, you have to understand laws that you maybe did that we didn't have to deal with, reimbursement laws and stuff like that. So it was totally different. And so when that came up, I was like, okay, we need to do another book that teaches like step one. So we actually moved back a step and now we're teaching like nurses how to become case managers. And then we already have the how to get a case manager certified. So what we're trying to do is basically create a business that we can help you from the time you be decide you want to go into case management to decide if you even want to. We have webinars where we teach like, this is what it is. Do you want to do this? And if you do, then we have courses and books that will help you to become a case manager. And then when you're ready to get certified, we have books and courses that will help you get certified. I love that. That's something that I'm thinking about the process that people go through. So like you said, they're a nurse, they're bedside, they're doing the clinical work. And they're like, I want to be a case manager. And to not have what's the next step. Like, right. I feel like there was just this big gap. It was just, you're a nurse and you want to be a case manager. So like, and then like you said, the, they, when they were training case managers, they, your first book, they were like, oh, this is helpful. But it wasn't what the need was. It was just, right. there, wasn't, there wasn't something there that was the next step. So pieces, you- Yeah, there were pieces. Missing. Yeah. 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 Yeah, exactly. So what I want to take out of that for the listeners is- always be always be listening to what the need is always be looking for where the need is i i can use myself as an example so when i started i similarly i was looking for a business plan that was simplified that would had a step by step how do you start a business when you're just you want to go from working in a structured environment to working online doing service type work and I couldn't find anything. Everything was really high level, high business. Like if you want to get a business loan and be a corporation and all of that stuff. And I thought, no, we need something simpler. So I wrote a workbook that's step by step. And the workbook walks people through. But the feedback I got when I did the workbook was I need help. Somebody to, to talk me through the workbook. And that's how I ended up developing my one-on-one coaching. It's like, okay, well, I can do that. And so it's similarly, it's like you start and just start. I think that's probably a a big key thing too, is you wrote the book and then from the book, you listened to where the audience was saying, oh, I need this or I need that. And then you paid attention and noticed where those gaps were to be able to fill them. And I would, if you wouldn't mind just kind of how, how long have you been, has your business been going from the time that you published the book? Yeah, that's a good question because I think sometimes people look and they think that you're an overnight success. But actually the first year I made zero dollars because the first year I was writing a book. So I spent money. I I didn't know. So it's important for your listeners to understand where I was when I heard this, you need to create the solution. I couldn't even write a sentence. Like honestly, I homeschooled my kids and I found other people to teach them English because I was writing nurses notes for so long that were these fragmented sentences didn't make any sense that I had trouble writing proper sentences, let alone paragraphs, let alone chapters. So I actually had to back up and take a writing class just so that I could learn how to write properly 
And, you know, you have editors, so it doesn't have to be perfect, but you have to make sense. You know, you have to be able to communicate what's in your head so that somebody else can understand it and then they can make it pretty. And so I had to take a writing class first. And I want to get back to your question. Oh, so the first year it was writing the book. I was also building an audience because I knew, okay, I'm going to create this book, but who's going to buy it? Nobody knows who I am. So I was also started a website was getting some SEO, some search engine optimization going with that by putting my notes on the website. So anybody who's searching for these same topics that I was searching for because they're not in any of the books would find my website and they knew from my what I had said on the website that I was creating a book, that this was going to be a book. And then when I was actually ready to publish the book, it took an entire year where I was making no money. I'm paying for classes. I'm learning how to publish, a self-publish a book. And I chose to self-publish because it takes about 18 months to get a book to publish. The test would be changing and the book would have been obsolete before it was even published. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have that decision to make. It was like that was made for me. I would have to self-publish. I had to learn how to do that. I had to learn how to find an editor, how to do interior design of a book. All of these things, cover design, all had to be learned. So there was money put out. But then the next year, the second year, we made about 40K, which wasn't bad for a side hustle. And at that point, I didn't really have a lot to do because I had already built my audience. I had already done all the other things. So that was like really easy money the second year. And then it just kept going up from there. So my business, I wrote the book in 2018, I believe. And then I published it in like December of 20 or 2013. Yeah. So I started making money in 2014. So that was like the first year that I made any money. But the year one of my business was just creating the product. I really appreciate you sharing that because you're right. I think a lot of people when, and it's like when you say, oh, here's a success story, like people, they mentally, the timeline they think is really short. Like, oh, you published a book in six months and then your business took off and like 2013. So the first year, nothing. And I'm honest with people too. My business, first year, nothing. I had to figure out, and I self-published my um, workbook. It's on Amazon and I had to figure out how to do that. And it's different than an actual book book because it's a workbook. So it's the the layout and like it's got places for people to fill in information and stuff. So there's a lot of research and learning and understanding that goes in and money. I I don't want to sugarcoat things for people because it's really planning out what it is that you have to put out to get that return. And then so your business, your book published in 2014 and then how how long was it? And, and you don't have to be specific because it's hard to remember all the details, but when you actually started doing the business. So you did you did the book and then you did a course, right? Am I understanding right. that? So actually before the course was even done, we went full time with it. So the timeline, like we we published in December and then about a year and four months about later, they came out with the blueprint for the next exam. And that was probably in April of 2016. So we're like a a little over a year in. And I was like, oh, that's okay, because this is like just an update. I can do this really quick. I can just, it's not going to take a lot. But when I started actually doing it, I was like, I can't work full time and get this book out in such a short period of time. Like I can't, the other one took me a year. I thought it was going to take me three months. It, It wasn't. It was going to be a major second edition, like a major redo. And people were asking me like, hey, the August test is changing. When are you going to have the new updated book out? And so they needed it before then, which means I had to get it to an editor before then. You know, I'm I'm like backwards planning this. And I'm like, it's just not going to happen unless I quit my job. And that was a scary thought because it's like, okay, my benefits, you know, my steady income. We were doing well enough with the book that we were almost making enough to cover my income, but not quite. But then there's expenses that come out of owning a business too. So like, yeah, the money's coming in, but now we have this new book that we have to edit and do the interior design and the cover. So it was kind of like a risky thing, but I knew that that was like my decision. I had to make a decision right then whether I was going to just fold the business and it was doing really too well to just fold it. So we made the decision. By this time, my now partner was kind of helping me make decisions. And our goal was to move to Mexico. So I couldn't work for the company that I was working at. And we're like, well, it's cheaper to live there. So we can probably live off of this uh. until we get there and find out. So yeah, we made the decision. I turned in my resignation 
and then started working full time on the next book. That book, that was the second edition and that went out and that one did really well too. Like I said, by that time we had like an audience and a community, a Facebook mm -hmm. community. So we had an easy way to let people know that this was coming plus our email list. And then I think about a year later in December, we did a test. People were telling us we want a course and we're like, okay, but when you have to pay for it, it's one thing to say you want it is another thing to buy it. So we did, I found somebody else who had reached out to me who was a case manager for years and she's like, oh, I have a course we can just use mine. And so we collaborated on that. We did a like an online Zoom first to see if it would actually sell. People bought it. They showed up. It went really well. We got good feedback on it. So then we recorded it and made it on demand so that people could watch it over and over again. They could watch it mm -hmm. from the comfort of their home. And that did really well. And so we've since, I think that was around 2016 when we created that. And We've updated it with every exam change and it does really well. That's one of our top sellers. So I'm taking notes because you're saying a lot of things that are like, they're all different podcast episodes that I've had because <laughs> it's like I'm following your business, how your business is started and then and grew. And you're saying things that I, I really want to emphasize to the listeners because they're in my other, a lot of my other episodes with other business owners, my solo episodes. So you collaborated. That's a one, yeah. big one yeah. for the listeners out there. I'm collaborating all the time. I'm connecting and, and talking to other people. You being on my podcast right now, I consider that a collaboration because you're giving such valuable information to the listeners out there that they can, oh, I need to do this. Oh, she did. Okay. I probably need to think about that. It's just such a beautiful thing to listen and hear your journey from publishing a book all the way to what you're doing now. The other thing that you mentioned is that you changed your life to fit to do what you wanted to do in the business. And that's something too that I've had on my podcast and myself. I'm a full-time RVer, my husband and I, that was our dream. We wanted to travel around. We wanted to do that anyway. When I started my business, we moved here to Colorado on purpose so my husband could take a job so that I could launch my business. So it was like, we knew what we had to do. I didn't want to go back to work somewhere and have to work and do my business. And he's like, I will take a bullet. Like, I, I'll go ahead and work. I'm fine with that. And we picked a place that we like. So we really would love to be traveling all the time, but we sacrificed and said, okay, we're going to park here long enough for us to get your business launched and what you need to do. And then we can hook up and start traveling again. So it's those sacrifices that you make. Like you mentioned, it. It was scary, like you're leaving your job, you're leaving your benefits, but you had a partner that was like, okay, do we really want to do this? And making that decision to say, okay, yes, we're going to go ahead and do this and we're just going to, we're going to adjust. We'll have to adjust certain things and that's okay. The other thing that you said multiple times that I really want to emphasize, and, if, and I'm going to ask you to expand a little bit on it because I think the listeners could really use help around this. It's something that, it's a question that comes up all the time is, building your audience. So earlier you mentioned that you had a website and an email list and you started to put things out there in SEO. Can you expand on that a little bit in in the sense of kind of how did you go about that? Because you you didn't have anything when you started. Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, it happened in stages because I think people, they see what we have now and they try to do all of it and you can't do all of it and build your business at the same time. And you know, you're trying to do, you do have to do all of it at the same time, but not everything of all of it. So what I mean by that is we build an audience. The first thing I did was just collect email addresses. So I have a website up. I'm putting articles in. The articles were exactly. Now, if you look at how many people were searching for these terms, it was very few people that were searching for them, but they were my exact audience. Mm. So that's where, you know, so we get people to the website and then we had an email opt-in and all it was, honestly, you know, you hear about lead magnets. All ours was because I'm thinking, okay, who, somebody who's taking this test, what do they want? What do they really want? They want to know when the next piece of information is coming and I want them to keep coming back. So my whole opt-in was you'll, I'll email you once a week with all the new articles so that you can get the new articles. And by the time the, the book launched, I had enough people that I could send a free PDF copy of the book to, ask them to read it so that when it went live on Amazon, 
they could leave a review. And then when we also started at a low price so that they could actually buy it if they wanted to, which would help again with the Amazon's algorithms. So that's all we had was a website and an email address to start. And that was our audience. Then we expanded. One of the things that our people were asking for was practice questions. And so I spent a lot of time trying to create practice questions and I realized I hated it. It's easy to come up with a question and an answer. It's hard to come up with three other answers that sound like they're the right answer, but they're not. And so I had about 150 of them, but I didn't have enough to create a book or a resource. And I just decided I wasn't going to do it anymore. And so by that time, Avi was my business partner. And he's like, why don't, you know, we should be starting a community. Communities are starting to get popular. You know, Facebook groups came out. And we're like, but how are we going to get people into this? Like, what are we going to? So we, he came up with the idea of, well, we could post a question every day and the next day post the answer and a new question because that's what people want. And that's where they're going to have to go to the community then to get it. And I was like, well, I don't like having things on my calendar or things I have to do every day because, you know, I create this business so I could do what I want. And he's like, I will take care of posting it. So I wrote the questions. He posts them every day. Believe me, they would not be there if I had to do it. I can't, I can't be that consistent. So he posts the questions every day, and that's how we started our Facebook community. So we also did some very purposeful things. Like we didn't want to become the experts. We didn't want it to be ask a question and Deanna will answer it. We wanted right. to bring people together where everybody's the expert. Everybody has their own area of expertise. And so we purposefully would not answer questions for like 24 hours and let other people come in and answer. And then, and that was really good because people started to, you know, realize that they also have expertise and talents. So now we have a Facebook group that we can market our own products in. It's growing. Other people are, are joining it. We have the email list and we have the website. So we're constantly, and yeah, then we started going on LinkedIn. So we started to just kind of like building one block, getting it really good, and then building the next block on top of it, getting it where we felt like, okay, this is good. Now we can build the next thing. So we were very purposeful about not trying to do everything. If you spread yourself really thin, you can't do everything well. So you end up with, yeah, you have, you know, you post every once in a while on Facebook, but you're not consistent about it. And I'll be yeah. honest, I have some things that I'm just not consistent about. I do have, you know, Facebook pages that maybe I didn't, but I have a group and the group's really active and I get most of my, you know, most of my referrals from the group. So I don't, I'm okay if I kind of neglect the page, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I love that you said to focus on one thing, because you're right. If people try to do all the things at once, you end up spreading yourself too thin. So you, like you said, you're not going to be consistent in all of it, and you're not going to be as good. So it's not going to be as good quality. You're going to forget things or not not be as engaging. So more things came out of that, which is so beautiful. Because this is all the stuff that I teach. So I love hearing a success story that's like, you did all the steps of the things that I help people. So you were specific. So for those of you listening, when you're building an audience, so I'm picturing Deanna with no audience at all. And she started with a website to collect email addresses. She, she looked for what they're searching for. So it's okay to be specific. I think that's a huge thing with people. They think they need to talk to everybody and because they're going to miss somebody. And I love that you said that you were specific and looking for your target audience, people that, and you said it was small and that's okay because they're the people that are going to actually want to engage with you, want to get more information and be on the list. And you did a simple email collection, which was really just telling them, I'm going to give you more information. These are people that are looking for your information. So that's giving them what they're asking for. That's a big one. And I think it's another thing for new people starting out. And I've made this mistake where I put out what I think people want instead of thinking and then maybe even going and doing some market research and asking what would be helpful for you so that I'm giving them what they're really searching for, what they're really looking for. Yeah, And, and you ask, that, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Real, just real quick to kind of what you're saying, we actually just did that. So we have four authors. We Now we also have a, a very small niche publishing company just for case managers. And we have several authors that have book proposals out to us. So we put a, full, a poll in our Facebook group and we're like, okay, of these titles, which ones are you interested in? And that 
doing market research, before we spend a lot of time and effort and money, we want to know, are there people that are interested in these topics? So we're continuing to do market research. It's like you never really know. You think you know. And I've made mistakes where I thought I knew. And I was like, oh, yeah, I know. This is exactly what my people want. And they're like, they might want it, but they're not going to pay for it. Yeah, that's a good point, too, is a lot of people will take things for free. <laughs> They'll take whatever because it's free. And then they may never use it. It's not really what they wanted, and but it was free, so it's okay. Yeah, I totally get that. Th the other thing I want to highlight that you said is that you asked for help for something that you didn't want to do. And that's a big one because I think we think we have to do everything and we have to do all the things even if we don't like it. Yes. And learning to delegate was really hard for me um, because, you know, I think maybe when we're in like the medical and health profession, so much is on the line with everything that we do that we tend to just, you know, if we do it ourselves, we know it's right. And we can tend to be perfectionists. So it was really hard to learn to delegate and it's okay. And it's, it's actually hard to learn that it's okay to make mistakes. I see mm -hmm. health professionals when they want to start a business, that's their biggest fear. It's like, well, what if I make a mistake? And it's like, it's okay to make mistakes. You actually want to make mistakes because when you make a mistake, you learn one way not to do it. And yeah. we get paralyzed by this. There's so many different things to do. I don't know what to do next. We'll do something. It'll be right or wrong. If it's right, keep going. If it's wrong, it's okay. Nobody died. Like, yeah, died and try the next thing on your list or pivot or do something different. And I find that healthcare professionals get so paralyzed because we're so used to every decision that we make and everything we do being a life or death matter. And it's not in business. It's absolutely not. Yeah. Yeah. That's I. I'm so happy that you brought that up because it's so true. And we're our nervous system is wired that way. We're trained that way. Like, here's the protocol. If this happens, do this. Because if you don't, you're going to have an adverse reaction. It could be deadly. It could, someone could get very sick. Even in case management, it's a money thing. You could make a huge right. financial mistake when it comes to insurance and billing and what's happening with, with the patients. Like everything has a lot higher cost. Then yes, yes, I put a piece and of content not, out and it didn't work. And it's not your cost. <laughs> it's like it's not yeah. your cost. You're like other people are depending on you. So in case management, if I make a decision that's wrong and I make somebody an outpatient versus an inpatient, they could have tens of thousands of dollars of bills that they have to incur now because I made a mistake. So yes, they're very high. And with the business, it's it's not like that. Like people make mistakes in business all the time, and they just like okay, move on to the next thing and nothing bad happens. It's not a big deal. Yeah. It's like, oh, now we know not to do that. Yes, we just exactly. won't do that next time. But yeah. Uh, thank you so much for bringing that up because that that is such a huge thing. I wanted to, to shift our focus a little bit because you and I talked about something before we recorded that I just want to bring up the topic because I've shared on my other episodes and talking about people doing what they're passionate about. And I know you and I had a little mini conversation about this. So I just wanted to have that conversation with, with the listeners. You had a different take on that. So what is your take on, oh, go do what you love and be passionate about it. And it can be a business. And I want to hear the, your take on it because I love that you brought it up. And I think it's something people need to be thinking about. Yeah. So, you know, when I was first listening to business podcasts and reading books and you know, they, they talk about this Venn diagram where something that you're passionate about and something that you can make money and something that you're good at. So like these. And so I was thinking that, well, I'm not that passionate about case management. I mean, yeah, I'm passionate. it's my job, but I don't go home and read magazine articles about case management in my spare time. And I know people that do, but I'm like, ah, that's just not for me. I want something else. And so for that reason, I thought that this wasn't necessarily going to be the business that got me where I wanted to be because it didn't have that component. What I've learned is it needs to be something that you can be passionate about. So it doesn't necessarily mean that I, I still don't read. In fact, somebody sent, it's so funny that you mentioned that. Somebody sent me a text today and says, hey, do you want to read this article? And I'm like, no. I <laughs> said it's about, it's about, it, it's like, no, it's research on problems about these. And I'm like, no, I have no desire to read that article. Now, if they would have sent me something fun or like a Netflix movie or something, I probably would have mm -hmm. said yes. But like to read an article about a dry topic matter, absolutely not. But what I am passionate about is helping people. So what is your core passion? My core passion is I love to help people and I can help people pass an exam. I can help people become case managers. And I 
And I'm passionate about case managers. I feel like they do a great job. I feel like they have a lot riding and we need to make their lives easier. So I'm passionate about making their lives easier. I'm passionate about making sure that the client at the end, the patient or the client gets what they need when they need it for the, you know, with the least amount of cost to them and that they get back to their normal living as quickly as possible. I'm passionate about all these things around it, but no, I'm not going to sit at home and read a bunch of articles on it. I'm not reading, you know, thick books about it. I'm not doing all of that. The other thing that's really important is sometimes when you are passionate about something and you make it your job, you're not passionate about it anymore. Mm -hmm. To think of a yoga instructor, like somebody who loves yoga, they love to do yoga. They're really passionate about it. They talk to all their friends about it. their friends all do yoga and they go, they decide that they're going to go and become an instructor. And now instead of them just getting to do yoga, they have to worry about billing, getting their classes scheduled, people dropping, getting new members for their classes, um, all these things around it that they didn't have to do before. And sometimes they grow to not like it because it's a job now, something that used to be their out and their way of relaxing and something that they enjoyed is no longer something that they enjoy because now it's a job. Yeah. Yeah. See, I, I it's so important that you explain that differentiation because that's the key thing is you can be passionate about what you're doing, but if you take something that you're passionate about personally that you enjoy, you can make it not enjoyable because now it's a business. And I have that example. My husband and I had a photography business. We loved to take pictures and we loved working together. That was our thing. We, we like working together. And they were like, oh, we can just make this a business. And I started doing all the business side and he was doing the editing. And it, we stopped in two years because we both realized that it took the fun out of taking photographs because we were doing all of the extra editing because we were doing it for other people. So it had to be done in a certain time frame and they wanted things done a certain way. And then we had the billing and then we had the, the business set up and the marketing and the getting and we both were exhausted and we were like, nope, back to a hobby. So for the listeners, it's OK if you want to do a business out of your passion. Just know that you're going to have to spend a lot more time on the business side, less time on the passion side, and it can diminish the passion for it and make it so that it feels more like work. Yeah, I'm similar. I have a business background and then I was in the medical field. So I kind of I kind of created it, joined it together because I do love business. I love everything about it. And I had gotten a health and life coaching certification. I started doing health coaching and I'm like, I don't want to do this every day. I wasn't passionate about the health coaching piece. But like you, I love the business side and I knew I could help people that wanted to do health coaching. So then I'm still supporting because I do support health coaches. I love that there's coaches out there helping people, nutrition people and mindset people. And like all those people that are helping people get healthy and live all these healthy lives. I just didn't want to be one of them. So I'm like, how can I take what I know that I love doing and do that part to support them? And that helped me to know what I should be doing. Just like you, you love case managers and you love supporting them. What can you do to help them be the best that they can be? Absolutely. Yeah, this is so good. Before we go, I wanted to ask you, what are you doing now? Like, I know we kind of talked about the journey, but what's going on right now? What's happening in your world and in your business? And then I would love for you to share how people can reach out for those listeners that are thinking, oh, I think I might want to do case management. So. Right now, we last year was a very pivotal year for us. We had brought on new people, a new person into our company, and a couple people left. So we, we were a very small company. We're not. We're very lean. We have a lot of contractors. We hire a lot of people, and I wouldn't say hire. We use a lot of people that are retired case managers. So they have all this knowledge, and they'll teach courses for us. So my whole dream was to get out of the working in my business and work on my business. In the last year, we really been able to do that very well. A person that we brought on a couple of years earlier was at the point where she's doing most, most of the day-to-day -day operations. So that's wonderful for us. So what one of our dreams, you know, we lived in Mexico since 2016 and we absolutely loved it, but we wanted to travel more. And so now we're like, well, instead of just living in Mexico and traveling to all these places, we want to travel full time. So in June, we actually left Mexico. Now, we're still residents there. We will still go back there. In fact, we're going back next month for a week. But 
we're traveling full time. We're going to be in Europe for a while. We're going to go to Israel. We're going to go to Asia. So we have all these plans to do a lot of traveling. And the business is at the point now where we did a couple test runs. You know, we did some test runs. I was in Turkey in April for, you know, 10 days. How does this work? Can we do this? Last year, I took probably a week or two off almost every month. I, and it was just because visiting family, going on vacations, and everything worked well. So we we feel very confident that we can, we're at, our business is now at the stage. Going back to what you said before, it didn't happen overnight. This has been mm -hmm. going on for several years. and But we feel like it's now at the stage where we're not working on it every day. We can now, you know, leave it in the hands of capable people. I'm still involved with it, very much involved with it. But I can work on projects as I want and then, yes. you know, let things, other things happen. So we're, you know, we've got systems and processes in place. It's just all part of the evolution of the business, doing one thing at a time, working on one thing at a time, getting all these, you know, things going, getting all these products and these resources to the point where it, we were very purposeful with everything we did. We wanted it to be not linear income. Like we wanted it to be, you create it once. And then you sell it for a while. And then you add something else onto that and create it and sell it. So it's very different than a service-based business mm -hmm. uh, in that regard. We started doing a little bit of coaching this year. Very, very little because I don't like to see anything on my calendar. So ah, <laughs> but yeah. we have so many people reach out and they're like, oh, I want to do what you did. And it's like, okay, well, we take a select couple people and we work with them to help them to kind of replicate what we did and start them off where we started and let them know it's, it's a process. It's not like within a day, you're going to all of a sudden have this, but... We're happy to help with that. And so that's what we're doing now. We're kind of transitioning. We're the day-to-day -day operations of the business. Basically, that's not what I'm doing every day is waking up and going to work on the business. So we're traveling, yeah. a lot, doing a lot of fun things. Yeah. Yeah. And and that's I, I'm so glad that you brought that up because you you've said this several times since we've been chatting. And I want to emphasize this. Everything you did was purposeful. So really, yeah. people listening, you worked on something and got it working and then added to it. So again, we're going to emphasize not trying to do everything at once. So the business started and we're talking 2013. So we're 10 years ago. And now we're thinking, wow. So it did not happen overnight, but you have a beautiful business now that you can go and travel and it's taking care of itself. And you're able to oversee what you need to oversee, work on project work, and the reason that I, I want to emphasize this for the listeners is I talk about when I work with people at the very beginning, I say, I want you to visualize the end result. I want you to think about how do you want to be functioning day to day in a perfect world when your business is totally thriving and doing what it should be doing? Because yeah. that's where you are right now. That's you've gotten to that point, but it wasn't overnight, 10 years. And it was step by step by step. So it, I, I really, okay, for you, those of you listening out there, there is no overnight business. I mean, maybe there's an anom anomalies out there where somebody got famous on Instagram overnight, something happened, and all of a sudden they have money fl flowing in, which I'm sure that happens and great for them. That's not the norm. And, and even at that, those people usually learned how to, they were spending 10 years learning how to optimize and building an audience and then something took off you know most yes. of those things that you hear of, of overnight successes are not really overnight successes and to re re reiterate one of the things that you said <laughs> was everything was purposeful because we had other opportunities that would come to us but we kept looking at okay the end goal is to be able to work from anywhere and travel if we take this path this great opportunity is it going to result in us being able to do that and we said no to a lot of really good opportunities. Look, like, that's for somebody else. That's not yeah. for us because this is, you know, we have a, people reach out to us all the time. Can you do in person? No, we can't do in person because yeah. I, you know, I, everything is online for a reason so that I can do it from anywhere. And if I have to be in person somewhere, that messes up. Like if I'm in Thailand and now I have to do this in person event in, you know, in, say Phoenix, Arizona, I now have to spend two days traveling to get to something and then being jet lagged. So that doesn't fit with my lifestyle that I wanted for myself. And so we purposefully kept looking at the what you said, what do you want your business to look like down the road? Because 
you can say, and you can say no to an opportunity and another one will come by. It's not like that's the only, that's what I thought though. I thought that that was the only opportunity. Thank you for saying that. Thank you so much for saying that. Okay. Everybody listening, if, if you've tuned out, I want you to hear this. You get to make your business be what you want it to be. You can say no to opportunities and another one will come up. If it doesn't fit into your plan for what your vision is, you can do something different. And I think that that's been, people think they have to do what everybody else is doing. Like success isn't going to happen if they don't do it the same way that everybody else is doing, if they don't take every opportunity. And I'm there with you, Deanna, because we're we're full-time RVers. We want to be able to travel. And I have criteria that has to be met for me to be able to do that. And I'm like you, I don't want to do in person because I want to be able to be in, you know, a nature preserve somewhere out in the middle of nowhere and not have to travel, (laughs) find an airport or whatever. You know, I want to be able to just do whatever. So, yes, for those of you listening, you can do your business to fit your lifestyle. It doesn't have to be like everybody else. Thank you. Thank you so much for saying that. That was like the biggest nugget. I think I'm going to use that as like some audio clips (laughs) because it's so good. It's like really good information. Before we go, do you have one tip that you could give the listeners based just on your experience of the last 10 years doing what you're doing and something that they could take away from the episode? Yeah. So, you know, when I first started, I listened to a lot of podcasts and one of them I listened to was John Lee Dumas and he had Entrepreneur on Fire. And he had a saying, so I want to make sure that I attribute it to him because it was his. And it would, every time that I would start to go a little or start thinking about going off course, I remember this. And it was a motto that I lived by at the time. And I, so maybe it'll help your people also. And he said focus. And he used the acronym focus was follow one course until success. And so when I would start to get that bright, shiny object syndrome, we're like, okay, I'm going to write this book or, you know, this is what I'm doing. But then another opportunity came up or something else. And it was like, no, follow one course until success. So until this book is done and complete, and it's either deemed a success or a failure, I can't start another project. I have to complete this one. And then we just kept doing that. So we just kept adding on with one more project. And now we can expand a little bit now because I have a team. So Mm -hmm. when, you know, we can maybe handle more than one project at a time now, but when you're a solopreneur and you're just starting out, finish that one thing, do that one thing, follow that one course until success, and then you can start something else. And you can write down all those ideas you have. Like I kept a little notebook and I would like, oh, that's a good idea. I'm going to do that someday. And you write it down, get it out of your head, and then continue working on what you've decided that you're going to work on until you hit success with it. That's perfect advice. I love that. And I will get the information from you for the person that that spoke that because I want to put that in the show notes because I want people I want to give give credit and allow them to do research around that too because that's so huge such great tips thank you Deanna so much for being here for those listeners that are interested in learning more about you and your business where can they find you so I have a podcast called the stay-at-home nurse podcast and I'm not how should I say this again I I like to live by my own rules so it's Mm -hmm. not like every week you're going to hear one but I do, um, when I'm inspired, I put out some new episodes. We have a website with the same name, The Stay at Home Nurse. And if you're actually interested in case management, um, it's not just for nurses, it's for other healthcare professionals as well. I only know how to do nursing case management. So that's what I teach. But I do have other, other colleagues that I can refer other disciplines to. So we have the Case Management Institute, and that's our website for any information on case management. Awesome. Thank you so much. And I will make sure and put all the information in the show notes. Thank you for being here and taking the time. This was such a good conversation. (laughs) For all the listeners out there, as always, keep it simple. Thanks for listening to this episode of Starting a Business Simplified. If you enjoyed this episode, then hit the subscribe or follow button on your favorite podcasting platform so you never miss an episode. Have you thought about starting a business and didn't know what to do first? You're in the right place. I've created a simplified step-by-step process for starting a business. Click on the link in the show notes for information on how to get started today.